if you were to ask people on a street corner, what should every Christian be? What, what every Christian should be? What, what kind of response you get? You know, uh, uh, you know what kind of expectation? Uh, it, it's interesting, a while ago, uh, there was an article on expectations of pastors, and, and it's, you know, if you ask every church member what their expectation of a pastor would be, it's, it's you know, unbelievable. And, uh, and, but what about a Christian? What about you? If you went out on the street and you just went down the street and said, well, what should every Christian, what, what should every Christian be? We'd get such a variety of answers. Well, maybe a, a Christian should be a churchgoer. That would be a good start, wouldn't it? A, a believer in God, a reader of the Bible, a, a praying person, maybe a caring person, someone who lives what they believe. Others might answer that every Christian uh, should be ashamed maybe for believing in, in myths. Others still would maybe say, I, I, I just don't know what any Christian should be. I'm in America. I'm a Christian. What, what more do you want? You know? uh, so it's just interesting if we really thought about what every Christian should be. Today, I believe that instead of confusion, that Romans, and we're just finishing, if those are visiting today, a two-year study in Romans. We're just about coming to the end. We're in chapter, we're ending in chapter 15, and then the last chapter is 16. So it's been a short journey of two years. <laughs> and uh, mixed in when we have special speakers and things like that. But every Christian, I want to give us three different uh, answers to the qu uh, question what every cr Christian should be. The first, I want to point out that every Christian should be equipped for ministry, because we are the priesthood of believers. We're ministers. Every believer is a minister. Sometimes if I had asked, how many ministers do we have visiting our church today, would you raise your hand? Well, look around. It should be everyone, because we're called to the priesthood of believers. There's four requirements that every Christian must meet to be able to be a minister. And I, I want to go over four different areas, I believe, that, that God calls us to as we think about every Christian being equipped for ministry. The first requirement is that of a Christian character. Romans 15, 14, the apostle told his readers, I myself am convinced, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness. Full of goodness. They weren't just good, they were full of goodness. In Psalms 34, 8, it says that the Lord is good. So the Roman believers were very much like God as that when they came to it, they felt that being good is a character that would represent Christ. Are you full of goodness or are you just sometimes good? Do you have good and bad days? The Bible says we should be full of goodness. My son used to wake up, and he's not here, so I can pick on him. And uh, he would get so mad at me because I would say, man, what do you wake up on the wrong side of the bed? Or, you know, you got you to face today and be a, a, a good mind. And a good he goes, well, Dad, not everyone's happy every morning like you are. You know, it's like, well, get up earlier then and get happy. You know, he just, you know, it's just that I, I deserve to be in a bad mood, so leave me alone, Dad, Okay. And, uh, and, and we just wouldn't quite get, get on the scene. You know, we rub each other in that way. But we're to be of good character and full of goodness. This is where I believe all ministry begins and all ministers begin. Before we can do, we must be. Before we can function in things that God would have us function, we've got to be. And, and part of being is being in the presence of God and allowing his presence to to live through us, to be and being a Christian means being in the presence of God and, and letting that soaking of God come through our lives. Goodness is part of the fruit of the Spirit that the Holy Spirit wants us to produce in us. In Galatians 5, and 23, it, it, it's, it's a whole list of things that as the Holy Spirit takes a part of our lives that we're able to have the peace and the love, and the joy, and the patience, and the goodness, and the self-sacrificing, uh, and, and all the fruits of the Spirit that, that, that happens when we spend time with God. 
It gives us the ability to be able to have pure motives and be disciplined as we submit to the authority of Christ in our lives. And, and a lot of times, getting in the right mood and getting in a good mood means a, a dying to self and submitting to his authority and then saying, now today, I'm not living for myself. I'm living for God. If I'm living for God, then that puts me in another place, doesn't it? I want to walk in representing God in this place, not, not this old man here that, that ha in his old nature. I don't want a stench of death that I used to walk in. I want to have the aroma of Christ. So that means I must put myself and be disciplined to put myself in a place that when I walk into a place, I'll have the aroma of Christ. And that's not easy. And, and that's difficult. And it's not an easy road to hoe. But I believe it's a responsibility as a Christian to be able to walk down a way worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's where ministry begins. The second requirement for ministry is through the knowledge of God's word. And in 14, it says, as Paul continues, that I myself am convinced that you yourselves are complete in the knowledge. And there's a link between goodness and knowledge. If you have goodness without knowledge, you're a candidate to, to minister to others, but you're not maybe necessarily ready. If you have knowledge without goodness, then others may consider you as hypocritical. We need both the goodness and the knowledge to walk hand in hand. Why is the knowledge of God so important for ministry? It's because that's where our power comes. That's where our foundation lies in. In Psalms it says we can prevent people from committing sin as they understand the word of God. And Isaiah says the word of God always accomplishes God's purposes in the lives of those who hear it. In Romans 10, it talks about the builds our faith in those who listen to the word. And then in Hebrews 4.12, it talks about that the word of God judges the thoughts and the attitudes of people's hearts. The word of God is important because it brings people into a newness of life. And First Peter talked about that. So as we get the word of God into us, it becomes actually part of us. It's living and active as, as Hebrews 4.12. It's living and active through you and living and active through me. It's not living and active when it just is on the shelf. But the Word of God says that it's living and active and sharper than a double-edged sword. As we walk into the place, we carry the Word of God in our lives. Charles Steinmetz was a known as the electrical wizard at General Electric in the early 20th century. And after he retired, the other engineers at GE were baffled at the breakdown of, a, of some of the complex machines. And so they asked Steinsmetz if he would return to help them out. And Steinsmetz spent several minutes analyzing the problem, and he took a piece of chalk and he made a cross mark on a particular piece on one machine. To the engineers' amazement, it turned out to be the precise location of the breakdown. A few days later, they received a bill uh, from Steinsmetz and it was for $10,000. It was a staggering sum in those days for just a few minutes of work. They returned it to him with the crest that he item, itemized it, and he did as follows. Making one cross mark, a dollar. Knowing where to put it, $9,999. <laughs> Knowing from God's word how to solve people's and personal problems. Knowing where to point people to, to is a key to ministry. That's the whole purpose of going through training and equipping yourself and going to Bible studies and going to Bible college and seminaries. All that is to be for equipping so that you can help others and point to them to the area that they need to resolve and, and, and work through. People need more than a caring heart if you want to be a minister of the gospel. You need to have a knowledge that helps you. The third uh, brings us to a, a requirement for ministry, and that's, again, in Romans 15, 14. It's an ability to counsel others. There's a competent to instruct one another. And the Greek word translator here is, is for instruct is, is, is the normal term for teaching. It carries the idea of counseling by means of verbal warnings. You are competent to counsel 
one another. God gives you the ability to be able to one another, to be able to be there to counsel, to equip. James Adams wrote a book, Competent to Counsel, based on this verse. And he states that there are three basic models of counseling in the world today. Freudism, Rogerism, and Skinnerism. And named after Sigmund Freud, Carl Rogers, and B.F. Skinner. And all of these had some truths in the philosophies in which they gave. And if you've had any um, uh, psychology classes, you get a lot of the training or counseling classes. But Freudism counsels the believers that people aren't responsible for their actions. You know, my mother made me do it because she hung me out to dry or something. I don't know. But their behavior and attitudes are problems stem from bad treatment uh, they had received from others, such as an abusive father and alcoholic mother. Biblical counseling, though, by contrast, says that we are all sinners, and we're all responsible for our actions and attitudes. Rogerism is counseling is built on the premise that people have inside them the ability to solve their own problems and make the right decisions. So in his counseling, he refuses to give advice and, and their training. Their job is to basically repeat back to the counselor what they said so that they can hear their own thoughts and arrive at their own solutions to their problems. Now, and, and again, there's truth to a lot of these things that they're all can be tools to be used, but it's, it's absent of the biblical training. By contrast, to this biblical training assumes that people cannot solve their own problems apart from the wisdom that comes from the Word of God and the powering of the Holy Spirit in their lives. B.F. Skinner believed that people are a product of their own environment. Skinnerism counselors believe that to control someone's behavior, you must control their environment. People are basically animals who can be conditioned to act certain ways. By contrast, the Bible counseling is based on the conviction that we are not animals, but we're human beings created in God's image. And so we reject Skinner's notion that, that change our environment was to solve our problems. Our real need is to change our nature, that when we trust in Christ, God gives us a divine nature. He makes us into a new creation in him. In 2 Peter 1, 4, it says this, through these he has given us is very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption of the world that caused by evil desires. So God gives us the ability through the Holy Spirit that as we gain the knowledge of his word and we allow on him that we can actually help people work through a lot of the situations in which they, they live by. Many pastors can say that to their church members, as Paul did, you are competent to counsel one another. It was never God's plan for a, a pastor should carry all the counseling load or all the visitation load or do all the works of ministry. Too many pastors are trying to do a work of 100 people when they should be doing the time recruiting 100 people to do the 100 chores. Ephesians 4, 11 and 12 said it was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors, and some to be teachers, all for the purpose of raising the body of Christ to become mature and complete in the works of service. And so really the job as a pastor, sometimes we get phone calls, well, I was in the hospital, you didn't come and see me, and I was this, and you didn't do that, and all these things of what I, you know, I may not have done. And uh, sometimes they can say, well, you're in a small group. Did they come visit you? Yes. Did this person come and see you? Yes. Then what do you need a pastor for? You know, I mean, I'm just a person where you had a pastor or minister come and visit you. But again, it's the old mentality is that a pastor has to be there to hold everyone's hand through every walk of life. And that's just not the reality of what God wants us to be. God wants you and I to minister together to be the body of Christ. Do you regularly receive phone calls from others in your church? Do you drop by uh, the workplace and, or the home and visit people? Are you engaged in ministries of you just taking time to be with another person? There's a book that was written called Simple Church. And Simple Church just meant 
by when, when two or three are gathered in my name, there I'm in your presence. And simple church means that we can go out for a cup of coffee, and, and as we meet together and we discuss the things, God just comes into the conversation. And then in that place, you're able to bring about, really, the Bible as it's walked through your decision. Simple church is when you get with people who normally wouldn't go to church, and just by your life, you're making a changeover. I remember in California that, that uh, there was a place that we'd go down to the wall to go fishing for salmon. And the, a lot of guys were out of work. It was wintertime construction. And they go down there with Jack Daniels and marijuana, and they get there at 3 o'clock in the morning, and they set up and make a fires, and they wait till morning to fish to get this place on the wall. There was sometimes 50 to 75 guys there. Where little by little, me and another guy from church started to go down there, and we didn't preach or anything, but they found out I was a pastor. And all of a sudden, they started asking questions. All of a sudden, we had a bunch of those guys, come, a whole family started coming to church, and they start, all of a sudden, there wasn't that swearing, and guys stopped bringing their booze down there, and it kind of clean. And, and it wasn't that we would never tried. All we did, we went there, and we tried to serve. And uh, it wasn't about being preachy or anything else, but as your light shines, I believe God uses you in that direction. And I was, I was not there to preach. I was there to fish. <laughs> you know, I, I didn't want to go there and do work. I was there to fish. But in the midst that God used, and simple church happened there. And all of a sudden, I ended up marrying some of the guys. I ended up doing some of the funerals. And I, I ended up being their pastor, even though they didn't even darken the church door. At the same time, I was also coaching football, and the same thing took place. A lot of the coaches, it was one of the top schools in California. And I, there, was a, there was 10 football coaches just for varsity. And I, somehow God just allowed me to stumble and bumble my way in that door. I ended up being their pastor. They called me Coach Rev. And I, I did weddings. I did funerals. And, and that, that to them, I, and they quit swearing on the sidelines. And, and they started praying before each. And I never asked for any of that. I just wanted to be a light. See, God can use you in the place in which you live. It's just that you're making yourself available to be a minister of the gospel. It's not the guy who's up here standing. It's you who gets sent out to be a witness for him. If you think that sharing the gospel is an option, then you don't have a ministry mentality. We must share Christ because it's our responsibility to be ministers of the gospel. When we take the gospel of Christ to others, we may come back with fewer friends. We may be ridiculed more. In a lot of ways, uh, people will joke and they'll say things about you and call you all kinds of things, and they put a higher expectation on you when you start saying that you're a Christian. And, and a lot of times you become the blunt or the brunt, whatever word that is for your, the jokes, until they're in need, until something happens, until something critical happens, and all of a sudden they find their way to you and they start asking you questions. When we take the gospel to other people, we've got to expect there to be persecution. But Paul's purpose of bringing the gospel, we see in verse 16, so that the Gentiles might become an offering acceptable to God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. You see, Paul took off out of his comfort zone, being a Jew, going into the Gentiles. And it was a very, it was a very foreign thing for him to do. It wasn't a natural thing. It wasn't an easy thing. It was a whole people's group that he didn't even know a whole lot about. But God called him out of his comfort to be able to place him in a place. And today, I don't know about you, but I'm forever grateful for him reaching out to the Gentiles. God views everybody as precious. And he gave the opportunity for even the Gentiles to be able to become believers. And then when we do, through the Holy Spirit, we become an offering acceptable to God. And all of a sudden, we're now adopted into his family. It wasn't so at one time, but it is today. Kent Hughes explains how our lives change when we serve Christ with a ministry mentality. He says a, a pie baked for a neighbor becomes an offering to God. A child held in, in love is a liturgy. 
He says, an employee treated with dignity is a beatitude, and the gospel shared is a song in heaven's courts, a Sunday school class taught well by the fragrance of God. See, it's not what happens inside the church, I believe, that really counts. It's the offering that takes place when we walk outside of these doors. Do you have that ministry mentality? Do you think of yourself in these type of ways that God has placed you here with a purpose? And that purpose is to bring people to his son. In this new year, can you have a mindset, a ministry mentality that God has given you spiritual gifts and he wants to use those gifts to minister to others. That everything you do would be for the glory of God, not for yourself. That God has a plan for everything that happens to you in this life. And as you walk through this life, and you become sensitive that you're not walking this life for your own purpose, but for the purpose of others. That as you walk through life, the disappointments, the mountains and the valleys, that God uses those times that you can bring others to him. And some of the greatest times in our life is when we walk through the valleys of life because that's where more growth takes from. If you've ever been on a high mountaintop, you might think it's a great experience, but there's hardly any growth on the mountaintop. The growth is always in the valleys, and the same is true of our valleys of our lives. So God first fills us with his goodness, and then through the study of Scripture, we become complete in his knowledge, and we continue to grow in the knowledge. And a result of that knowledge, we're able to counsel other Christians, share the gospel of Christ with lost people, and that's a plan for every child of his. The second thing that every Christian should be is that we become a tool in God's hand. In Romans, in the verses 17 and 18, it says, Therefore, I glory in Jesus Christ, in my service to God, I will not venture to speak anything except what Christ has accomplished through me. What he was saying is that he didn't look at his own accomplishments as badges on a gun or uh, knocks on a gun or, or trophies on the wall. He, he looked at his accomplishments and said, look what has Christ has done through me. All I am is a vehicle. All I am is a tool in God's hand. And whatever I've accomplished, I've accomplished because has been his hands upon my life. Paul did amazing things in, in human stance. He, he brought a young man back from the dead in Acts. He was a founder of many churches. He led countless people to Christ. He was the apostle to the Gentiles. He penned at least 13 of the 27 books of the New Testament books. And he didn't take any credits for that. He just had the, he had the mindset that I'm just a tool in God's hand. Paul considered himself just merely a vehicle for God to use. In Acts 1, verse 1, Luke wrote that the gospel was recorded that all that, that, all that Jesus began to do and to teach. All the apostles themselves, as they continued to do the things in the name of the Lord, they all were giving, they just considered themselves channels of blessing from God to be able to touch others. None of the apostles took credit for their own works. They all gave glory to God. And that's the same thing that God wants to do with you and I today. He wants to channel his blessings, his works through you to be able to touch others. And then in, when that other touches the others, then you both give glory to God. And there's no satisfaction, I don't think, that's any greater than be able to know that God is using you and you make yourself available to be able to reach somebody else, to touch somebody else, and then that person gets that right, right relationship with God. And when you see what takes place in their own life, there's such a satisfaction that you give glory back to God because you see that a wholeness and a completeness and a person being fulfilled in the things of God. In verse 18, it goes on to say that Paul is... is God worked through him that in leading the Gentiles to obey God by what I have said and done, helping people obey God was the great commission that Paul endured. Matthew 28, 19 through 20, Jesus said that we make disciples, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded to you. We call this a great commission. 
And Jesus told us to teach people to obey him, to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey. He promised to work through us to accomplish that goal. Many ways that God could have chosen to save the world, but for some reason, he's just using you and I as that vehicle, and he still uses that today. God taught Moses this lesson when he spoke to him from the burning bush in Exodus 3. He said that the Lord was saying to Moses by an object lesson that I can make this bush glow with my Shekinah glory, then I can make you glow too in the glory of God. If I can speak through this bush, Moses, then I can speak through you also. And the same that he spoke to Moses, he speaks to you and I. That he wants to be that fire and allow us to have the fire of God in our life and in our bones and that he wants to have that Shekinah glory flowing through us, and that the words that we speak would be the very words of God to be able to speak life into situations. And so many opportunities that you have. I believe that every one of you every day have opportunity. You can speak life into a situation that is dark and hurting. If you just start thinking in a, in a ministry mindset that you're there to minister the gospel and you can speak life in healing in every situation that God puts you in, if you would only have a mindset in the eye to be able to see things that way, then you too would have a great commission mindset. I believe this is why we need to have our lives and our services bathed in prayer, in that relationship with God and that communion with God, to have his hands upon us and in us, as he turns our work into his ministry. In Romans 19, Paul continues on, and he was able to see through his life signs and miracles through the power of the Holy Spirit. The book of Acts records many of those signs and miracles, but God did extraordinary miracles through Paul. Even a handkerchief that Paul had touched and prayed over and given to a sick person, and that person was miraculously healed. Because Paul had a faith and walked in such a way that was worthy of God that, 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 that God channeled such a blessing and work through Paul and many of the other apostles and, and many people since then that walk in such a way that they're in such a tune with God that people even get healed by them walking next to them and them just praying and touching them. Evil spirits are cast out. And healing starts to become a renewal in people's lives. Every Christian should be eager to take the gospel to the lost people. Paul continues, from Jerusalem to all around, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ. It was his ambition to preach the gospel where no one had, was known. He started in his hometown, Jerusalem, and then spread himself out. It represents 1,400 miles that Paul traveled to be able to take the gospel to people in other lands. That's what our denomination does. And if you give, we take a faith pledge, and we're involved in missionaries who, who are sent all over the world, building churches and, and works that are being done. And in a small way, we're a part of that, that you might not be able to go in person but we go with our dollar bill as we give it to the faith pledge. A professor in seminary, George Ladd, told his students, Christians don't have any right to hear the gospel twice until everyone in the world has heard it once. God has called us to share the gospel. We should be ambitious to reach those who don't know Christ. My sons went to Elmira Christian Center to a Christian school, and back then Brother John was alive, and he was, you know, older in his years and just about the end of his life in his ministry. And I remember going there, and we were having, uh, I didn't agree with everything that was going on. I'll just end it there. But we went to a, we went to a soccer game, and uh and the kids were playing soccer, and they're having a great game. My kids were there in the soccer team. 
And all of a sudden, I look over, and I see Brother John. And he's walked over to the basketball court where there are people in blue and red hair and earrings, and they're smoking a cigarette. And he was over there at 80-something years old. It was just, he died just a couple years after that. Here he was preaching the gospel to some of that is completely out of his comfort zone. This old man going over to these teenagers that looked pretty weird and strange. But he had such a love for the lost that even to the end of his life, he was sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. What about you? Do you have ambitions for that? Paul so much had such a fervor for that that he told in verse 22, he says, that's why I often have hindered uh, myself from coming to you, is that he had such a desire for the lost that those who he brought to Christ and were grown in Christ, you know, he, he said that even though I love you, I can't spend time with you because I just got to keep reaching those who don't know the gospel. So many times people come to church and, and they want to be pampered and babysat and clothed and they want their diapers changed time and time. They never get out of their diapers. And I, I know none of you are like that, but I know other churches are like that. And uh, they never get the umbilical cord because they always want the pastor to be there. And see that there's so many people to be saved. There's so many people who are dying without Christ out there. And sometimes we're so concerned about our own self being fed and cleaned up and, and, and you know, everything else being done that we've never been potty trained enough to be able to go and do it on our own. We're still in diapers. What kind of Christian are you? Do you see the non-Christians as a mission field? Let me challenge you to think this. Not only are you a minister of the gospel, but let me challenge you this, that you also are a missionary. And I believe that God wants us in this new year to be able to have the fervor that Paul had, to be able to think of yourself as a missionary. There's a sign that says upon that door, that when you leave this place, you are now entering your mission field. Would you look at your workplace? Would you look at your school buddies? Would you look at everything that's outside as your mission field? And let me challenge you this year, that let me challenge you with this thought, is that would you try to each one reach one? Would you be willing to say that this year, I want to just reach one person for Christ? Maybe some of you would say, I, every week I want to try to reach one for Christ. Maybe you'll say every month, but at least one, a year, that you could be able to say that I reproduced myself and someone else and brought them to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. See, I believe that the early Christians had such a burden to be able to reach the lost. That church was a place that the lost came into and the new Christians came into and they got fed in the Lord, in the Word, and then they went out there to serve the Lord wholeheartedly. Don't be satisfied with just coming to church and filling in the pew. But would you be willing to, to be able to look at others and be able to say that that's my mission field? Ask the Holy Spirit to put a burden on your heart for the lost, if you don't have that, for someone that you could reach and, and, and bring in. There's no greater value. There's no greater reward to me than to be able to see someone that was lost get saved. I'm forever grateful for the guy that brought me to the Lord, and, and I still today communicate with him, and I, I still thank him for bringing him, taking the time in high school to be able to sit down at lunchtime. He brought a Bible, and he was ridiculed and everything else, and, and at first I ridiculed him. And what the heck is it? But all of a sudden there was something that drew me, and he invited me to church, and I couldn't believe this Catholic boy was going to a Baptist church. It would never do that. But there was something in him. There was something that drew me to him. And then one day after church, in my, in, he gave me a ride home. And I received, I asked Jesus Christ into my heart. And he, he was only a Christian for a few months. He was only a Christian for six months. He was already leading other high schoolers to the Lord. That's why I say to the, our young people, they're not the church of tomorrow. They're the church of today. What about you, church? Will you be the church of today? Will you be ministers and missionaries to be able to reach out and get someone who's hurt, someone who needs the Lord? Someone, you know, if, if, if they're lost, they need to find Jesus. And would that be an emphasis this year in your heart 
And if you don't have it, then pray for it. Pray that God will ignite a fire in you to be able to reach the lost. Let's all stand in a closing word of prayer. Hi, I'm Pastor John McConnell, and I'd like to welcome you today for watching our program. It's just amazing the technology we have today that we're able to live stream all around the world. And we'd like to give you an opportunity, if you'd like to give towards this ministry, you can go online and be able to uh, follow the directions that are on there and be able to give to the ministry that you've been watching. So God bless you. We thank you for being part of Southside Alliance Church today.